Hi, you're watching this survey of breast and prostate cancer genes. My name is Van Warren. This is my bioinformatics term project at the University of Arkansas Little Rock. The course instructor is Dr. Mary Yang. The method I'm going to use is to ask the questions effective investigators ask. These are the standard questions you see in journalism, but they also apply to science. The first question is who? For breast cancer and prostate cancer, we have a lifetime risk in women of one in eight, a lifetime risk of one in nine for men for prostate cancer, and men also have a breast cancer risk of 1 in 883. There were 300,000 plus women diagnosed with breast cancer in 2020, that's the projection, and almost 200,000 prostate cancer diagnosis in men. 42,000 of those people in female category will lose their lives to this disease, and 33,000 plus men. Germline mutations are believed to account for 5 to 10 percent of the risk of these two cancers. Interestingly, both BRCA1 and BRCA2 are associated with increased risk of both kinds of cancer. For BRCA1, the increase in lifetime risk is 72 percent. With men, it's not as well characterized. For BRCA2, it's 69 and 20 percent respectively. And we know the principal risk factors for these two cancers are gender and age, but young people get them as well. So we're now focusing on our questions for breast cancer, we want to ask how many, where, when, what is the rate of discovery, how can we estimate how many remain to be discovered, and what are the connections between breast cancer and prostate cancer genes. In the project proposal and midterm report, I went into quite a bit of detail on how the genes were counted, and I won't repeat that here. The current count using OMIM as our source is 672 genes confer risk for breast cancer and 434 genes confer risk for prostate cancer. One finding of this report is that prostate cancer is not as well researched as breast cancer. There's no Susan Komen Foundation for prostate cancer that has the visibility and no race for the cure for prostate cancer. If we just look at two search engines with Bing, for instance, we get 38 million hits for breast cancer and 11 million hits for prostate cancer. If we look at Google Trends, we can see the yearly increase in interest, probably as a result of the Susan Komen activities, while prostate remains at a lower baseline of interest about half that of breast cancer. Our next question is, where are the breast cancer and prostate cancer genes? What is the actual population of those genes on the chromosome? And here you see a plot, and at the very bottom you can see the intrusion of both breast cancer genes in red and prostate cancer genes in blue, and that's the number of genes relative to the number of coding genes on each of the chromosomes. Even though these genes are important, it's hard to see them because they're down in the noise. If we divide the number of coding genes by some arbitrary factor of 20, we can actually scale and see that the breast cancer and prostate cancer genes are relatively uniformly distributed through the genome. It's not as if there's one chromosome that's responsible for all the breast cancer or prostate cancer risk. Nonetheless, there are genes that are worse than others. The average distribution of BCPC genes is 3.3% and 2.1% with a standard deviation of 1%. We'll get into the meaning of that in a second. Chromosome 1 has the most BCPC genes with 66 and 36 genes respectively. Chromosome 13 has the highest load of these genes per coding gene at 6.4 and 4.6% respectively. Chromosome 15 is our least loaded breast cancer gene with 2.1% of its genes putting us at risk. And chromosome 22 has the least prostate cancer genes at 0.8%. Interestingly, there are no male breast cancer genes on the Y chromosome, and there are three prostate cancer genes on the Y chromosome. If we dive into details, we can look at the distribution of the breast cancer genes per coding gene and prostate cancer genes per coding gene in these two columns. We also can reflect that against the number of base pairs, the total number of coding genes, and the absolute number of coding genes here. Our next question is, when were the BCPC genes discovered? If we use OMIM entries as a guideline, we see that the entry of these genes into this pivotal database looks like this, where we have a very high rate in 96 to 2006 decade, with it tapering off as we come into the present. And again, we see that the rate of discovery of breast cancer genes was higher than prostate cancer genes. Does that mean that there are more of them, or does that mean that we're behind in the discovery of prostate cancer genes? This talk doesn't answer that question. We can also ask what the rate of discovery of these genes was to get an estimate of how far along we are in the process. And it looks like that, again, in that decade between 96 and 2006, there was heavy discovery, followed by a second push between 2006 and, say, 2012, 2013. Then we see that the rate of discovery is dropping off. 
Does that mean there are fewer genes to discover, or does that mean that, say, research funds were curtailed? This survey doesn't answer that question. But it does appear that the lion's share of work has been done if we look at the overall trend. Next, we want to look at what are the connections between these genes. By searching each OMIM gene entry, we can find other gene entries that have relationships with the target gene by citation. We will do the important work of enumerating what these specific relationships are later. For now, we will use guilt by association with all of its concomitant strengths and weaknesses. We find that because they have 167 genes in common, that if we want to pile these both together into one connection map, we have 939 genes that are going to be connected with each other. It might be that if we focused on the shared genes, that we could have a single therapy that would treat both cancers. This would be beneficial to both genders. We need to explore these specific gene-gene relationships, but there are so many of them to cope with, we need a new tool to advance our understanding. I've built something I call a gene connection microscope. It exploits the peculiar power of the human visual system to sort out motion in complex contexts. This coat is held together with scotch tape and rubber bands. Let's watch it in action. Please hold. So here we have a six-membered ring. The nodes of the ring represent the objects in our model that we care about. The arrows represent the relationships between objects. For example, here we have the relationship between the zeroth object and the first object. We can view just the arrows, just the nodes, and the names of the relationships represented by the nodes. From a selected node, we can select each of the nodes once removed, twice removed, or thrice removed, and since each operator should have its inverse, we can back out once, twice, or three times to end up where we started. Here's the data tables for the graph of our problem. Here we have a table which lists the names of the nodes, the node's hyperlinks, which we will use in a moment, and any imagery associated with the node. There's a corresponding edge table which lists the first node, the second node, and the name of the relationship between them. Connections between objects indicates they have a relationship that we care about. We will explore this more in a moment. The strength column captures our notion of the certainty in the relationship, and it can be used to calculate the certainty we have in a given line of reasoning. So here we have a six by six grid of objects with the relationships between them. As before, we can proceed from the selected nodes once, twice, and so on and then back again. As you can see, selection is an algebra in itself. We will use this later for filtering out things we care about. We can also randomly scramble the grid and watch it write itself. We can select a few items and turn on gravity to get the other things that we don't care about out of our way. And we can change how heavy or light things are, and then we can turn gravity off again if we found what we want. We can use this same approach for examining trees of relationships of varying complexity. Let's think lexically for a second. DNA, RNA, and protein are operators in the language of life driven by the central dogma. The complexity of this language, the nouns, verbs, and modifiers, is what makes us who we are. We are expressions in the handwriting of God where the strokes, letters, and words enable the construction of proteins, replication of cells, and after a time, us. Written language has a sequential component. Words come one after another in strings, motifs that are parsed into meaning. The language of the cell runs concurrently with many parallel components operating at the same time. In this example, we represent the famous line from the play My Fair Lady as a graph. We see the words, parts of speech, and in the case of nouns, some relevant imagery. So we can bring in not only rings, grids, trees, but also tabular information and note that there are relationships between entries in the table. These can be lateral relationships, geometric relationships, and so forth. So here we have something familiar, and we'll see how long it takes before you recognize what it actually is. I usually like to start here with my favorite alkali metals and then arrange them in such a way that they make sense. And here are some biologically important ones and those that don't appear in biology but do make things glow in the dark. Here I'm looking for our complementary elements to the alkali metals, and that is the halides, and here they are, and their noble gas companions. And then finally we're left with this. If our screen was a little bigger, we could stretch out the table properly. Now that we have the ingredients, let's bake the cake. First, let's look at the breast cancer map. The breast cancer map has 672 nodes and 3,404 edges. The most connected nodes can be seen here. In most applications, for example, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Photoshop, the algebra of selection is Boolean. 
meaning an object is either selected or not selected. In this application, we use multiple selection to prioritize items by how many times their selection occurs in a query sequence. This enables the discovery of subconnections, which in turn can lead to rapid elucidation of pathways between genes. This is all best illustrated by example. TP53, a cell cycle apoptotic arrestor, is the most connected gene in the breast cancer map with 95 connections to other genes. P10, the second ranking gene, is a tumor suppressing phosphatase with 74 connections. Mutations in P10 facilitate further genetic chaos. We select TP53 and fetch its connections by using the expand selection operator. Now we select P10 and ask the same question using expand selection again. The result is that genes common to P53 and P10 influence are doubly selected. We now decrement everyone's selection by using the contract selection operator. We can now use the hide unselected operator to show the remaining players. This leaves only those genes common to P53 and P10. We can screen capture this result for offline analysis and comparison. The prostate cancer map has 434 genes and 1,427 edges, except that P10 is the highest ranking with 67 connections and P53 ranks second with 41. We can repeat exactly the same process as before. We select P53, fetch its connections by using the expand selection operator. We decrement everyone's selection by one. We now hide unselected to show the remaining players. This leaves only those genes common to P53 and P10 in prostate cancer. We can also show the protein structures for the remaining genes. We can screen capture this result and compare it with the first. Now back to the breast cancer map. We can select the top 10 BC genes and arrange them in a circle. These top 10 genes by edge connections read like a who's who of famous cancer genes. P53, BRCA1, BRCA2, MYC, but are we as familiar with the other five? The power to visualize the whole picture provides us a great deal of leverage when deciding what to focus on. It's interesting that several of these proteins are DNA binding proteins having the leucine zipper structure we saw on one of Dr. Yang's slides. Let's lather, rinse, and repeat for prostate cancer. We can select the top 10 PC genes and arrange them as before. We immediately notice that six of them are the same as for breast cancer. As before, we can toggle node names, edges, and protein structures for the top 10. We can also propagate the connection to see who the siblings and cousins are. Now in the spirit of this investigation, let's finish by making a map that is the intersection of the genes common to both breast cancer and prostate cancer. The BCPC intersection map has 167 genes and 563 edges. Again, P10 and TP53 are the highest ranking with 55 and 33 connections respectively. We do the dance and save the image. Notice that if we wanted, we could also do the Boolean operations of set difference, as in, show me the genes that are in one cancer and not the other. We can also do the union of both cancers, but that graph gets very busy. So that is that. In conclusion, I must confess that I feel a little like a person who, having built an airplane in the garage, has not learned to fly it particularly well. I've managed to take off, land, and frequently crash. I've always said that the person who builds the airplane and the person who flies the airplane are two different kinds of people. There is so much tinkering to do so that the airplane can fly higher, faster, and carry a greater load. And that is what I am, a tinkerer. So I'm grateful you are able to see this. You and others will figure out how to do loops, spins, and barrel rolls, and in the process discover things that simply had never been seen before. That is the future, and what you discover will be the most exciting things of all. I would like to thank Dr. Mary Yang for teaching an excellent course in bioinformatics. I must also thank each of these people, particularly my wife, and my friend Dr. Dan Berliant, who, quoting Hillel, said, if not now, when? I deeply appreciate the work of the many teachers, scientists, and engineers at these institutions whose efforts made this work possible. The end.